the manticore, the cockatrice and the chimera. Do these names mean anything to you? If they do, then hopefully you'll still learn something new in this week's episode. And if you don't, well, dive right in. Welcome to Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. I do hope that you're well. This particular episode comes to you from underneath some new coronavirus restrictions here in the northeast of England. Quite luckily for me, they only really stop you from socialising with people and being an introverted podcaster. There's not much of that going on at the moment anyway. But I do hope that wherever you are, you are safe and you're well and your family and everybody else that you know as well because, you know, I wouldn't want to think that anybody wasn't, basically. Now, we are going to round off our Mythical Creatures Month with three hybrid beasts. This episode kind of went down a slightly different track, as you can imagine it would, because this is me we're talking about. And it seemed that there were three particular beasts that are quite interesting because they're all hybrids and they're not particularly famous now. And that was why I think I wanted to cover them, because of the fact that they weren't the obvious ones that we've done so far. And let's be honest, there is always something strange about a creature that's made up of different parts. A little bit like a child's drawn them. And they exist in this sort of liminal space where they don't belong to one particular species, but then they're often endowed with the strengths of all of the creatures that make them up. Now, we do get hybrid mythical beasts in quite a lot of classical legends, but then they do bleed through in the medieval literature, which is often where we pick them up. Now, we have already looked at griffins, which are essentially hybrid creatures, let's be honest, and unicorns, I think, can also be seen as hybrids because they have this oryx-like horn and then their horse bodies. Dragons are less so, I think. Dragons are kind of their own thing. But the three mythical beasts that we're going to have a look at this week are definitely much lesser known and where other creatures keep reappearing time and again i mean you just have to look at mermaids for that one and they're always reinvented for new tales and audiences these three in particular have rather faded from view so we're going to go and take a look at them now let's go and meet the manticore the cockatrice and the chimera Now, we are going to start off with the manticore, and this is a creature that's from either Persia or India, depending on which sources you're reading, and in some ways it is quite similar to the sphinx. Now, in most depictions, the manticore has the head of a bearded man. Apparently, they're quite specific about the fact that he then has either blue or grey eyes, a lion's body, and a tail made up of venomous spines, and some depictions also include a scorpion's tail, just in case the venomous spines weren't enough. The manticore also comes equipped with fearsome claws and the tails do say that they're capable of tearing apart a person in a single swipe. And then they also have a triple row of teeth in case that wasn't enough and occasionally accounts will also mention wings. So in these cases, not only can it run at impressive speeds, it can sometimes also fly. I must admit the wings are a little bit more of a modern edition, I think, than than the classical ones. Now, its name manticore translates as man-eater And it's quite interesting because right back to the Persian name for them, that's essentially what it translates as. And this references its favourite food. And according to the legends, manticores preferred human flesh. And when they did dine on people, they left literally nothing behind, not even clothes. And its favourite method of hunting was to lie in long grass so that only its human head was visible. And then as other people would come close, thinking it was a person in distress, the manticore would then strike. So clearly the answer was to avoid bearded men who hung out in long grass. Now I should point out that this part of the legend was potentially used to explain the disappearance of anyone who entered the jungle and didn't return. And the manticore therefore became a cautionary tale to keep people out of the woods. Now many of the stories you will not be surprised to hear came from our old friend Tessias, who obviously we've looked at before, who also introduced his readers to the likes of the unicorn and also the dog-headed man as well, which we haven't covered on the podcast yet, but we will at some point in the future. Now, Tessias apparently saw one when it was captured and presented to the king of Persia. 
Now, Elian claimed that the manticore actually came from India, not Persia. And in his description, the manticore can actually shoot the venomous spines from its tail as if they were arrows, which sounds both amazing and terrifying at the same time. Only the elephant seemed completely impervious to its sting, while the manticore couldn't actually bring down a lion. Now, referencing Tessias, wherever the stings landed, more manticores would then spring up. And in Elian's description, he also claimed that people would actually hunt young manticores to crush their tails, because then that would mean that they wouldn't grow these dangerous stings. Now, a later Greek writer, Pausanias, actually believed that tales of the manticore described a tiger, and he's way more sceptical than anyone before him about what manticores actually are. And he thinks that the claims about the three rows of teeth and the sting and tail was basically added as a way to share a fear of big cats. And let's be honest, if you came across something like a tiger, that would be terrifying in and of itself. You don't really need to add three rows of teeth in this venomous tail, but apparently people did. Now, obviously, naturally, Pliny the Elder, who, he does show up in quite a lot of these stories because he believed that they were absolutely real. They were an absolute God's honest truth thing on this planet. So he included them in his Naturalis Historia. And then, like other creatures from ancient mythology, the manticore then made its way into medieval bestiaries from his work. So it was occasionally confused with another creature called the man-tiger, which had tusks and the feet of a monkey. But the manticore is the one that it's easier to find representations of. Now, medieval writers did use the manticore to represent the devil. Yet, unlike the animals like the dragon, the griffin or the unicorn, the manticore has never really attained any kind of popularity. Now, that said, it does show up both in Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering. So it has at least attained some kind of longevity through these particular games. But it still hasn't quite made that leap into popular culture just yet. And that's really all there is to say on the manticore, to be completely honest. There's really not very much, which is why it hasn't had an episode of its own. Again, much like the griffin, it's one of these animals where there's legends about its origins and what it could do, but then there's no specific tales of it actually doing any of those things. So it's it's, it's kind of a little bit of a shadowy figure in that regard. Unlike the cockatrice, who does have an actual tail associated with it. Now, the cockatrice boasts a serpent's body and a tail, and then it's got the head, wings and legs of a rooster, which is a pretty strange combination when you think about it. Now, some descriptions also add bat wings, which makes it closer to a wyvern, and they also give it a tail complete with a sting and a forked tongue. And these were really quite popular in English folklore, and they do appear quite a lot in Elizabethan dramas, or at least they're named, they don't actually appear in them, because that would be strange. Now, people feared the cockatrice for its ability to kill people with relative ease. And some thought that a cockatrice needed only to look at them. Others thought it only needed to touch them or breathe on them. And its breath was apparently so venomous that it would actually kill vegetation. Which, interestingly, if you remember the dragons episode, was something that was believed to be the case about the ladly worm of Spindlestone Hoof. And only weasels were somewhat immune to the cockatrice death glare. So, so far we've now got elephants impervious to manticores and weasels are immune to the cockatrice. It, they're strange for they really are, but this is what the folklore says. And that said, you could defeat a cockatrice by letting it hear a rooster crow and then it would die instantly. And alternatively, you could also kill it by showing it its reflection. And obviously, we've done episodes on reflections and so on before. So if you haven't heard them, you'll find a couple of them. There's both the mirrors one and the reflection one a couple of months ago. Um, But obviously, if you did listen to them, you know where I'm going with this. It's partially that being shown your lack of a soul, essentially, or also there's something of the Medusa myth about it as well. Now, the cockatrice is sometimes confused with the basilisk, which most people, I think, are quite familiar with the basilisk by comparison. And according to the 12th century text, De Naturis Rerum by Alexander Neckham, you would get a basilisk if a rooster laid an egg and then it was incubated by a toad, which is incredibly specific. Now, the confusion then between the basilisk and the cockatrice came from a translation issue which was the same thing that we saw with the unicorn in last week's episode and in 1397 John of Trevisa translated basiliscus in the 13th century de proprietatibus rerum and try saying that quickly as cockatrice. 
Now, Lawrence A. Briner suggests that the classic cockatrice imagery, so this is the serpent with all the rooster bits, comes from illuminated manuscripts, and this is where unclear drawings and then these really weird verbal descriptions were essentially mangled and then led to this new design of the cockatrice. And indeed, some actually believe that the basilisk did exist, except it was actually a cobra, which is certainly an animal that can seemingly kill from a distance. Now, we'll go back to the cockatrice again, and it also appears in alchemical literature where it shares various features with both the salamander and the Ouroboros. And the Ouroboros, if you've never seen one, is essentially that circular snake eating its own tail. And here the cockatrice stands for the transmutation of metals along with death and rebirth, which is something that you definitely get with the Ouroboros. And in a way, it's hardly surprising that you would get these representations with the cockatrice because it is essentially a transmutation of different animals into a new form. Brainer does note that the ashes of a basilisk could apparently turn metals into gold, yet it's only in England that they actually use the word cockatrice instead of basilisk in this alchemical literature. And obviously if you are interested in alchemy, there was an episode about it last summer, so you can always find that in the archive. Now, despite the cockatrice's popularity in Elizabethan drama and poetry, it is quite rare within dragon stories in Britain because it does seem to sit with the dragon more than anything else. But that said, Whirlwell in Hampshire apparently suffered a cockatrice after one hatch from a duck egg. And much like the Lambton worm, which we met a couple of weeks ago, the, this particular cockatrice grew to a gargantuan size and kept snatching villagers for its meals. Eventually, someone put a bounty on its head because obviously you couldn't stand losing that many villagers and it was offered that four acres of land would go to anyone who could kill the cockatrice. A man named Green came along and he actually lowered a piece of polished steel into its lair. Now, the cockatrice didn't actually die the instant it saw its reflection, but it tried to fight it instead and eventually it fought until exhaustion overcame it and then at this point, Green thrust his javelin into it and killed it. Yes, apparently he did get his bounty, and there is still an area called Green's Acres in Harewood Forest, according to the Whirlwell History Group. And apparently at one point the village church actually featured a cockatrice on its weather vane. So it is quite interesting that this one does have an actual specific English folklore story about it. But that said, much like the Manticore, the cockatrice has largely faded from the popular imagination. Again, you're not going to see this on children's clothing, for example. Now we're going to round out this particular episode with the chimera and yes it is quite difficult to figure out how to pronounce that and also any of you heavy metal fans will probably have heard of the band chimera although it is spelled slightly differently. Now the chimera is the different one in this particular rogues gallery because it does actually come from mythology in a very specific mythology and it first appears in Homer's Iliad. Now it's usually described as being a lioness, it's always considered to be female, so it's a lioness with a goat's head at the back of the body and then a tail that had a snake's head, so she's essentially got three heads. And other people say that she had a lion's head and then a goat's body and if having three heads wasn't enough she could also breathe fire. So again, just kind of adding extra bits on there, left, right and centre. These kind of animals always remind me of that game that you play where you, you fold a piece of paper into bits and then everybody draws a head and then folds it over and then the next set of people draw the body and then fold it over and you end up with these weird sort of chimera-like things. I always feel like that's what these creatures are, but that's a side issue. The main theory about the chimera was that she was the offspring of the mighty serpent Typhon and the half-woman, half-serpent monster Echidna. Doesn't really matter where she came from, though she, she is obviously a figure in Greek myth as one of their monsters, as it were. Now, a sighting of the chimera was considered a bad omen, although nowadays I should point out that chimera is a word that lives on and it refers to any fusion of two or more animals. And it is also a term that appears within genetics, so you can get a human chimera, but for this we are going to stick to mythology. Now, unlike the other creatures in this post, I mean, the cockatrice does have the story in Whirlwell, but the chimera has like a super specific myth associated with it. So in this way, it actually has what, say, the griffin doesn't have. And this particular myth, I remember reading this one when I was only a child, and I can rem- I can't remember the name of the book that it was in, but I think it was like the Osborne Book of Greek Myths or something. And I remember distinctly the illustrations for this one, so it was quite interesting to, to come back to it again. But essentially, the beast was terrorised in the lands around Lycia, which I think is in the Anatolia region, and it basically seemed that no one could defeat her. 
So the king was obviously getting utterly fed up with this, as you would, and he ordered Bellerophon to kill her, although this was partly because the king wanted rid of Bellerophon and apparently thought that the chimera could do his dirty work for him. Except Bellerophon didn't get the you're supposed to die memo and instead he enlisted the aid of Pegasus, the famed winged horse of Greek myth. Now Pegasus again is a bit of an interesting character and could almost be considered a hybrid creature because it's a winged horse and he's the offspring of Medusa and Poseidon. Now Pegasus actually allowed Bellerophon to attack the Chimera from the air so at least obviously Pegasus could fly around and therefore keep both of them safe from both the monstrous heads and the fiery breath. Now Bellerophon obviously thought ahead here and he'd added a lump of lead to his spear. So the Chimera's breath then melted the lead and then when Bellerophon thrust the spear into her throat, this molten lead was what then killed the Chimera. And weirdly, according to Pausanias, who we met earlier, a relief of the battle actually appeared on the throne of Asclepius in his temple at Epidauros, which seems a really weird story to represent in a temple of healing. Now part of me is wondering, is that because it somehow represents... a a battle over some kind of health problem or did someone just really like the story? We'll never know. Now unlike the manticore and the cockatrix, the chimera didn't make that similar leap from classical writing into medieval text and I think part of that is because there is this specific myth whereas with something like the manticore it's written about in more of like a travel writing sort of thing like oh I've seen this animal and this is what it looks like and I think that's why the chimera doesn't do that because of the fact it's got the myth instead. Now, chimerical figures do appear, but they often have a different set of body parts where they appear in a lot of these medieval texts. And there is no real evidence that medieval scholars ever thought that the chimera was real compared to something like the cockatrice or the manticore. And even then, classical writers thought that she was actually a metaphor for volcanic activity in the Lycia region. So even at the time, there wasn't this sense of, oh, you could see a chimera unlike something like a manticore. So what lies behind the fascination with hybrid mythical beasts, both in classical times, medieval art and even modern popular culture? Well, it is true that all three of these beasts are far less well known in the 21st century. You do occasionally get manticores and cockatrices in heraldry, but not nearly as much as like dragons, griffins and unicorns. But we don't generally find manticores emblazoned on children's clothing the same way that mermaids are. And the last time I checked, the cockatrice hadn't had its own themed makeup line like the unicorn. And the closest parallel that I can really think of, other than where the manticore pops up in things like Dungeons and Dragons, is the fact that the chimera was used as a term in the anime series Full Metal Alchemist. And here it just denoted a creature made of different parts. And this is essentially where the chimera lives on through its use as a term in modern genetics. So when I was researching this, I learned a lot about genetics, which has got nothing to do with mythology. I do think it's interesting that it's the cockatrice alone that manages to penetrate English folklore, but there it sort of languishes as a bit of a curiosity from a bygone age rather than anything that pops up with any sense of regularity. So the cockatrice is a little bit like our worms up here in Northumberland, where they're kind of a very specific creature for a very specific story, and then after the story's finished, they sort of disappear from view. But it could also be that perhaps their role as a terrifying cautionary tale essentially puts these animals into a different category from their more famous mythical brethren, like the griffin. But who knows, maybe we're overdue a retelling of the tale of Bellerophon and the Chimera. Who knows? Now what I want to know is, had you heard of any of these mythical beasts before? Are you particularly fond of any of these mythical beasts? Or... Would you generally go for something more like the unicorn, the mermaid, the phoenix, those kind of like the the, the heavy hitters, like the A-listers, as it were, of the mythical creature realm? Do feel free to let me know. We are, of course, coming to the end of September. Uh, so therefore, obviously, the next episode that we'll get, therefore, will be in October because you, you all know how the calendar works. I don't know why I felt the need to explain that, but it does mean that we are going to go into autumnal stuff. So we're going to be looking at more spooky things. So we are going to be looking at some autumnal folklore. I've got a couple of things about death omens in there as well, because, you know, obviously Halloween's coming. If you've got anything specifically spooky that you'd like me to have a look at, please do feel free to put in a request and I'll either see if I've already done it as a blog post or I'll create a brand new episode about it. And as I mentioned in the last episode, the Patreon exclusive episode this month is going to be the Highgate Vampire. So if you're paying $4 a month or more, you will have that in your inbox for your listening pleasure. 
I think that's everything that I need to cover. So also, if you did miss my talk on spiritualism for the Folklore Podcast Lectures last week, you can actually buy a recording of the the whole talk uh, for five English pounds. And I will put the link to that in my show notes below. So with no further ado, I hope that you have a fantastic week ahead. I hope that you stay nice and safe and healthy and all the blessings I can offer you from here in Newcastle. And I will see you soon. Cheerio. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, feel free to subscribe using whichever podcast app it is that you prefer. If you do use iTunes, if you could leave me a review, that would be fab. Basically, it just means iTunes are more likely to recommend this to other people. And if you're interested in more folklore, please feel free to swing by my blog, which is www.icsedgwick.com. And that's Sedgwick spelled S-E-D-G-W-I-C-K. And you can find all of the links, images and other bits and pieces that hopefully you enjoy. So have an absolutely fab week ahead and I'll see you soon. Cheerio.